Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Reiner. Our guest today is Dr. Lee A. Learman, Dean of the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine here in Roanoke, a position he was named to about three years ago. And Lee, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Gene. So what made you leave uh, Florida Atlantic and, and South Florida, the, the coast, and, uh, and, and come to Roanoke to, to, to uh, head up the medical school? You know, I had been to Roanoke once before as a guest in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Carilion to give grand rounds. And even then, it was a short trip, but even then, something special was clearly happening with this new medical school uh, in partnership with Carilion and Virginia Tech. And as I was uh, serving as a senior associate dean there down in Florida, uh, looking for the next challenge that I would enjoy, I looked at the new medical schools because the new medical schools can do things that are innovative and nimble that really address the needs of healthcare today. And among the new schools, uh, the partnership with Virginia Tech and Carilion was co particularly compelling. Um, the alignment of mission of Carilion to, to, to improve the health of the communities we serve and Virginia Tech's uh, prosim uh, motto mm -hmm. weren't just words that matched. The leadership, the spirit, the culture of the two organizations uh, really attracted me to the synergies that might emerge from a medical school. Add to that that they had had a wonderful first decade under Dean Cinda Johnson's leadership as the inaugural dean, uh, and that there were no fires to put out. It was just building uh, additional uh, value for the school, and that's, that's the kind of job that uh, just perfectly fit what I wanted to do for this next stage mm -hmm. of my career. Is there something uh, fairly unique about the setup with uh, not only Carillion, but the Freyland Biomedical Research Institute and, and the school and how the students go back and forth. Is there something fairly unique about that? There is something unique. There, the, there are um, many public-private partnerships, but to your point, um, not all of them have the same uh, set of, uh, of organizations working in the same way that we do. Um, the Freyland Biomedical Research Institute and the Virginia Tech Carolina School of Medicine were born at the same time of the same parents mm -hmm. with, with at VTC with Carolina Virginia Tech, but in our, in our history, um, the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute was owned by Virginia Tech from the very beginning, and the Virginia Tech Carolina School of Medicine was owned by Carillion until July of 2018 when we uh, came in as uh, the Ninth College of Virginia Tech. Well, that situation in which we were co-located but, but separate worked really well uh, to get both off the ground. And the Institute has done remarkably well, um, uh, tremendously well, and bec has become a, a, a really highly valued partner for us, not only in helping our students have a world-class research education, by, but by creating an ecosystem for research and innovation, mm -hmm. which is, uh, as you know, uplifts all of us in, in Roanoke, and particularly um, at the School of Medicine. And now one of the things that, uh, Dr. Learman, you said that uh, you really want the uh, you like to say Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine is research-based, that the school teaches students not only to become compassionate and caring, but to be thought leaders. And we've talked about it before. What is a thought leader in, in your mind? Yeah, it's a great question. Thought leaders are, are the folks who, no matter what setting they're in, whether they're in a, a practice, working in a hospital, uh, working um, for in industry, wherever they're working, they're the folks who bring the ideas, who have the insights, who are able to say, aha, maybe we should do it this way, or maybe I just read something that inspires me to think differently about a problem. Uh, it, it's a cousin of lifelong learning mm -hmm. and, and someone with a growth mindset who wants to keep learning and growing, but the thought leadership means that they can articulate what they're saying in ways that inspire others to follow them. Uh, and we feel that this, this uh, nice combination of skills that we provide to our students really sets them up for that kind of a career. Do you want medical students, and, and this, I'm sure this has happened, but and again, because of the relationship with Carillion and, and the FBRI, the Research Institute, that if, if they're going through medical school and they have a thought, hey, we need to do something differently. Can we do this to make sure that people at the Research Institute or somewhere in the system know that they have an idea? You have to walk the walk, exactly. Yeah. If, if, we're, if we're trying to create um, bright and inquisitive and curious future physicians, 
we, we're probably selecting folks that already have that in them to some extent, and they're, they're going to bring those ideas forward. So we, we absolutely have to have cultures in each organization that welcome that input. Don't see it as exceptional or challenging. See it as part of continuous quality improvement of education, of research, and of patient care. Mm -hmm. That's that alignment and culture I was talking about before, where these environments welcome input by anyone on a team to make an observation that might lead to, to insights that improve everything we do. Mm -hmm. Your previous experience, did it involve medical schools? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been in that sort of genre? Um, close to 30 years. Okay. Yeah. So what's been the biggest leap, if you could do this, what's been the biggest few changes over the last decade or two decades as far as the way students go through medical school? Has there been any sort of big change in the way they go through? There have been many changes that have been easier for us to jump forward in with a new medical school than the, the challenges that face the older ones in going through the same change process. It used to be that we, we packed a bunch of people into a big classroom for two years and spoke to them, at them, um, and had them read a bunch of stuff to learn a body of knowledge, which earlier wasn't so big, but of course is, is uh, astronomical now. And then we set them forth into the clinical world with, with um, some precepting, some structure, but a lot of it was just learning by doing as they went through the clinical years of medical school. Um, there has been a lot more structure now imposed on medical education in very good ways. It's now a competency-based program. Graduates have to achieve certain capabilities, not only knowledge, but other capabilities that set the stage for their residency programs mm -hmm. and things. Well, more like practical knowledge or? Yeah, the s skill sets that range from how um, making sure that they can communicate appropriately with patients, that they have excellent clinical reasoning, that they are committed to lifelong learning, that they understand systems-based practice, uh, and uh, that they have skills that we used to assume they had that we're just now assessing in a better way. The largest change and the most disruptive change has been the transition from that large classroom model I spoke about to small group learning, mm -hmm. in which instead of the relatively economical approach of putting everyone in a big classroom and having a bunch of folks lecturing. Instead, to have them stay more at the helm in how they gather knowledge as they approach um, different cases that we give them. This is called problem-based learning. And what it means is that we put the students together in, in groups of seven with a preceptor, and they work their way through cases that are unknown. And they identify the knowledge that they need to learn. And then they go out and learn that knowledge, bring it back to the group, and work through the case. There's still lectures, but they're, they're uh, much rarer than they used to be. Uh, what this does is it, is it creates future physicians that are already learning clinical reasoning skills, not just regurgitation of knowledge, but how to think through, how to combine the information from the patient and from their reading to really to solve these challenging problems mm -hmm. our patients have. And when you're in these small groups, it's probably much more uh, amenable to sharing information, working as a team, rather That's than sitting in a big lecture hall with 100 people. Exactly. So they're learning those communication skills, those team skills. And as well, um, one of our curricular domains um, as the school started was called interprofessionalism. Right. So I wanted to the, mention that, yeah. At the very beginning, we had them learning together with nursing students and PA students uh, in, in areas of shared interest, and they would be learning how to discuss cases uh, together with their uh, uh, colleagues from the other health professions. Mm -hmm. Interprofessionalism is, uh, professionalism has sort of become a buzzword in the last five, ten years or so, but it's really about working across different disciplines, working with people in different facets of the healthcare industry for better results. And it, it's been elevated from something that was a bit of a niche that some schools really focused on to being an essential component of what's called health system science, where teams and being able to work as teams are part of those health system sciences that help our students become even better um, members of the workforce. Mm. Um, Lee, how hard is it to start a medical school from scratch? Is that a difficult thing, you know, as far as to get all the accredita accreditations, forge a reputation as a place where, you know, healthcare systems want to hire graduates from? But is it is it tough to get a medical school off the ground? No, it just it comes in a box. You just add water, and uh -huh. so you're all set. Okay. No, it, it's extraordinarily challenging to do, uh, and then to do it well and to do it in an innovative way is even harder. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of new schools. About 30 new schools have popped up in the last 20 years or so. 
And uh, some of them have really, from the very beginning, tried to do what we're doing and to be truly innovative and to try different ways of teaching and learning and assessing students. Well, not all the new schools do that. Some of them follow the rule book, they get accredited, mm -hmm. and they, they do more of a traditional approach to, to learning. So um, you know, I would say that perhaps you know, about half of the new, school, the new schools are trying to do something different. And in that way, um, by being innovative, you're, you're, it's, it's uncharted to some extent. So that's even harder. Um, the road to accreditation is a long road. Uh, it happens in stages and uh, it culminates in full accreditation, which is what happened in our medical school in 2018. Uh, and our next uh, survey, which is you know, we get periodically surveyed for accreditation, will be coming up in about five years from now. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, talk about the size of the classes. For small classes, I guess, 43 students? 42, 42 was how they started, and it's, it's almost like a craft brewery, you know. It's right, like, right. You know, and that's jumped up a little bit, right? It is. You know, we decided uh, after I, I came, I took a look at what we were doing and was so proud of, of everything that had occurred before in the first stage of the school's history. I said, yeah, well, let's see if we can grow within our same building. Let's see if we can just grow a little bit to sort of uh, um, help more students take advantage of this, this opportunity to be with us. So we've been at 49 students for the last couple of years. Uh, and we think it's time to really consider larger growth. And we have a pretty deliberative process underway to take, take a right. look at that. And I think, I think you've told me in the past you might be able to bump it up a little bit before you have to grow the footprint of the school itself. That's right. We actually were able to um, convince uh, our, um, the folks in Richmond uh, to give Virginia Tech a planning grant to um, really look at and study what kind of a building would we need in the future uh, for what we might call the ultimate size of the school. So we have a couple of years to work on that and mm. to really de de determine how big and, and uh, how long will it take us to get there. Mm. I wanted to talk about some more of the relationship between the school and the Freyland Biomedical Research Institute right across the street and across the hall. And some of the research projects you mentioned in some of the notes you sent, 171 research projects, I guess, in the current fiscal year. Carillion Clinic is mentoring about a third of them, uh, uh, the, about the same with the FBRI mentoring students at, in the medical school, and, or 10% by Virginia Tech, the Blacksburg based, uh, based fa faculty there. Does everybody talk about that? I mean, how, how, how good that background is for a medical school student to either be working with a, a you know, health care system or a research institute or a yeah. university? It's really a differentiating feature for us. You know, the schools that try to introduce really graduate level projects, and I'll define that in a second, they usually add an extra year. It's usually, you can't do it in four years. Well, we do it in four years because our research curriculum is a longitudinal one from the very beginning of medical school all the way to the end. And our students have a three and a half year mentored longitudinal research project, which is mentored. And as you mentioned, uh, about a th you know, third of our students are mentored by the PhDs who are situated at FBRI. Now, some of those PhDs are uh, members of their home departments in Blacksburg. Some of them are also members of the departments uh, that we have at, at the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine mm -hmm. and the clinical departments. That other third are Virginia Tech Carillion um, faculty who work at Carillion Clinic, and they do more of the clinical mentorship, often in combination with, a, with another mentor. Uh, and then uh, the rest, as you said, are co some combination or based in Blacksburg. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wonderful synergy, and the students, um, what, what makes this different is that students in medical school would typically use a summertime, perhaps do a, a project that they might not be quite as involved in. Here the students conceive of the, the question, design the study um, in, with mentorship, of course, conduct the study, and then present it and publish it in a way that resembles a graduate student. So they emerge with, um, I guess, a different way of looking at the world right. uh, from having done that. Almost an entrepreneurial bent to some extent. I'm, I'm wondering, I don't know if it's happened yet, but just from working with the Research Institute and the spin-offs they've done there, people like Rob Gordy, and I know they want to build a wet and dry lab there, that if, you're, if there have been students or there will there be students you think that will wind up being healthcare entrepreneurs in some way? Yeah, I would say uh, undoubtedly yes, that we're seeing more students coming in with an agenda of learning about innovation and commercialization because they're coming from backgrounds of biomedical engineering and other very creative intersections with engineering and design and medicine. And from the very beginning, they want to be able to continue their interest in 
innovation in building new tools, uh, new technologies for treatment and for assessment and diagnosis. And our job is to keep them engaged in that work as they do their research and so that when they emerge, they have that as a choice in their careers. Interesting. Talk about how many applicants you're getting, Lee. I mean, I know you get, what, a couple thousand every year for the 49 slots that you open up? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, um, delightful uh, to take a look at what's been happening in the last few years. So we were stable around 4,000 applicants for the 42 positions. In the last few years, it's been creeping up to 6,000, 6,500. This year, for the class that will matriculate this summer, 6,900 applicants for 49 positions. That's gotta be tough. It's, a, it's tough to, to kind of take a look at, the, at all of that, uh, those talented applicants and decide which 300 will come interview and among them, which 100 we will make an offer to to occupy our class of 49. Mm -hmm. When they interview, another thing that's quite special about our school is when in the interview we do, do something called the MMI, the mini medical interview. Other schools do this. It's a scenario based where students encounter a scenario, not a medical one, but a scenario that helps us learn more about their, um, their other, the other parts of themselves, how they, how they will handle difficult communications and things like that. What makes this different is that um, each student is interviewed by at least one of the members of our own community. The MMI interviewers include not only our faculty and members of our admissions committee, but members of our community for whom we're incredibly grateful for, for helping us understand who are the right people to be future doctors. Uh, and it also sends a strong message to our applicants that you are not just coming to Virginia Tech Carillion, you're coming to this community. Mm -hmm. Strong messaging and really great insights from our community members. Uh, we we uh, can't say enough about how wonderful they are uh, and how they help us to make the, make the best decisions. Uh, and these are hard decisions. That's course. interesting. Are they members of the medical community solely or are they all over I mean I it's, I was uh, I was at a, a meeting in town the other day and uh, you know um, and and I didn't realize how many Kiwanians for example <laughs> were MMI interviewers and and uh, yes they come from all sectors of our community interesting talk about how uh, we about how medical school students get involved in the community as far as uh, outreach or it's running on the Greenway or taking it. Just talk about all that because I, I know I've heard of things over the years where there's been quite a bit of that where you get assimilated into the community. Absolutely. And I think we started off um, wanting the community to know them, to really know them and bond with them and they, they with the community. That happens almost automatically uh, because this is Roanoke and it's mm -hmm. a wonderful place to, to be a new person in town and, and to get to know the folks here. What we're seeing now in the last few years is a much more intentional engagement, both through this, the kind of structured service learning opportunities we create in the medical school, but also the students just have their, their own wonderful ideas. You know, we have, um, as I said, all these clubs, organizations that do different things in the community. But a few years ago, before the pandemic, I walked into the medical school building to see what the students had cooked up for the refugee and immigrant in medicine uh, fair, the, the fair for, for refugees and immigrants. I said, hmm. isn't that nice? The students have made a, a fair for the refugees living in Roanoke. To, to offer them health services? Or? Well, yeah, I walked okay. into the building not knowing what to expect. So in the, in the atrium of our building, there it was. Um, there were translators in about eight different languages available. There, they were occupying the, the programs, um, which included community service organizations, different screenings, um, classes on how to prepare food, free food for those who came. There were all of these things happening in multiple floors of the medical school, and they were all organized by a couple of students hmm. and who just decided to do this and to create a refugee and immigrant medical association bran a branch at, at the medical school. So for all of the things that we do that are planned and structured and are more these days are more aligned with what the community actually needs. In addition to those things, the students are constantly coming up with their own wonderful ideas of how to become engaged. Mm -hmm. And where the medical school is, you know, it's, you can take the trolley downtown if you don't want to drive. You've got brew pub across the street and Starbucks and all that. You've got the Greenway right there. So it's, uh, I would imagine for some of the students that come in, they really, you know, it's not a huge city. It's not like John Hopkins or something, but they like that setting. They do, and you know, we, we came a little worried when we couldn't invite as many students to Roanoke because of the pandemic. And this mm -hmm. is true of our residency programs as well at Carillion. 
that you know one of the one of the big selling points about coming to these programs is Roanoke, right. and yet we were unable to invite them. Well, now we invite them back for second looks. The folks that we're likely to make offers to can come back, come come and take a look at Roanoke. But for a while, we had to create video types of encounters for them, and it's just not the same as being here. But nevertheless, we've we've continued to have great success in recruiting. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned COVID, Lee, and how w the last couple of years. How has COVID maybe changed the mindset about either how you train students or deliver, or deliver medical services? You talk about a multi-system response to being a, you know, to community health. What's, is there a mindset that's changed maybe in the medical community? And you're, a, you're an MD as well as a PhD, but is there a mindset that's changed at all in the last couple of years because of COVID? Uh, COVID has had so many different kinds of impacts, some of them inspiring and some of them depressing. So we'll start with the depressing. <laughs> Uh, the depressing is that uh, folks that have been doing fantastic um, care for patients, uh, you know, the great, the great resignation, the great retirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, folks are tired, and and the things that they used to uh, be delighted about in healthcare has has been challenged in the last couple of years. And so, um, and this, I'm not speaking of of um, Roanoke per se, but across the country, people are are just re they're retiring early, earlier than they ever were. We we'll burn out. Yes, and I think that the workforce, we're seeing a significant workforce challenge in Virginia moving forward. Over, we're going to need about 3,600 more doctors over the next 10 years in, 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 the, con in, in the state, in the Commonwealth. But uh, those estimates were based upon pre-pandemic analysis, and now we're seeing the, the, all these folks retiring early, and it's just been so challenging on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we're seeing people stepping up and showing the type of resiliency, and they never expected to be in 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 what what might be described as, you know, equal in stress to a, to a, to a war zone. You know, in terms of the type of right. challenges that they would have, they never expected that. But they're able, they're 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 making it through, and they're doing what they can, and the health systems are doing what they can to support mm. them through it. And it's it's so inspiring. I think about our our class that's about to graduate. And you know they've been they've been trained by healthcare heroes, and, yeah. and so the impact is that this generation of graduates, you know, they've been they've been seeing people who are taking care of patients under the most challenging circumstances, and still teaching them yeah. and helping them. So they're seeing um, that that humanism, that professionalism. Uh, they're also seeing how important it is to be able to uh, recover and prepare for the next round. So. I think they're coming out of medicine with much more of a service orientation. There's this Fauci effect that we that you may have heard it, about it, which is that all medical schools across the country are seeing an increase in applicants. Ours is a, is a bigger increase, but there is a, an increase across the board of people entering medical careers uh, because of the, the call to service that is now a part of that decision. Well, that's interesting. So they're not being scared away by the burnout and you see nurses and doctors staggering for the on TV, but so they, they really feel like almost like they're ready to go to war and they want to be part of the uh, be part of the action. Right. I mean, I think it feeds into some of what we, we we've heard about as the, as gen, the generational agenda of not so much loyalty to a to a, a company organization or place, but loyalty to your own purpose. So as as y these young um, talented folks uh, identify that purpose for themselves, uh, that it has to do with science and medicine. We do see more interest, which is that. So that's the um, mm -hmm. you know, that's the most exciting thing about this pandemic is that it's not dissuading people. I'm wondering if you, Lee, as far as when the medical school students go through training, you might see more like real life scenarios played out or under more stress just to see how they they handle it or what they're going to be faced with when they graduate. Right. We're so lucky uh, that uh, f we've had the simulation center, which is just a spectacular place to be safely you know modeling what to do in emergencies that would challenge any team mm -hmm. and so in a very realistic setting we we can put teams together um, that are dealing with impossible situations and have them um, go through that and then stop and debrief and talk about what worked and what they want to do better next time and that's always been a part of our education and Carillion's education of its, its of its residents and physicians and nurses so that was happening at baseline mm -hmm. which is good it's really hard to just make that up in the middle of a pandemic but if you have that as an ongoing uh, strength of your organization it helps people uh, feel mm -hmm. more prepared we just have a couple of minutes left I wanted to ask you real quickly do you see the medical school as an economic engine for the Roanoke Valley 
You know, I think we're a, we are a catalyst, we're an important catalyst. We're, we're relatively small as compared to what's happening at the Research Institute and at, of course, Corellian Clinic. But I think we've catalyzed something really important. We're one of those ingredients in that box that you add the water to, I guess. Yeah, we've really uh, created um, a system in which we, we have faculty who are coming to FBRI from around the country, partly because we have a medical school that is a centerpiece of what we're doing in, in mm -hmm. Roanoke. By the same token, we've got wonderful physicians who are coming not only to, to lead, but also to be members of faculty in the departments at Carillion who, are, who think differently about what it means to come to Roanoke and to Carillion because we have a medical school. Mm. So we end up being an essential ingredient for the, for the growth uh, of impact of both Carillion and of FBRI. And, and we'll be growing ourselves as well. So I think we have uh, our own uh, opportunity for direct economic impact through uh, our students. And of course, they're coming back. They're mm -hmm. coming back, they're staying, they're working uh, in, in this part of Virginia and at, in Roanoke. And so um, we're, we're also seeing more of that happen as well. So in all of these, both indirect and direct ways, uh, yet we, don't, we haven't quantified it yet, right. but yes, I do believe we're making an impact. Real quickly, about 30 seconds, what have you been most proud of over the last couple of years as a dean? That's easy. Uh, in, in these times, uh, this is the ultimate stress test of any organization in the last couple of years. The team of wonderful leaders I work with in the medical school and at Virginia Tech and at Carillion have have um, really helped us in the school to keep moving forward in the most important initiatives that we have underway, while also uh, mitigating a, an historic pandemic that should rock us to our knees. So bravo to the, the, those wonderful colleagues that have helped us to be so successful. It's really amazing. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. Dr. Lee A. Learman, Dean of the Virginia Tech Crowley School of Medicine. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Gene. It's been a pleasure to be with you. I'm Gene Morano. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.